Say, you know what, uh, would somebody take a look at the monitor? Because um, usually when I do something like this, I ask them to put a light on the floor. I don't think we'll have a problem, but when they put lights above, I have terrible circles under my eyes. But these seem to be coming straight on, so there shouldn't be. Uh, take a look and see if I have. See, let me show you. Look now. Can you see the circle? <laughs> see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So is it okay now when I'm looking this way? Especially after. Uh, especially after 16 hours in the airplane with no sleep. Uh. What? Yeah, I slept a little in the airplane, but you know, not like at home in bed. As a matter of fact, it was the roughest flight I've ever been on. Not rough, this kind of rough, but it was like this all the time. Very, very. Uh, strange uh, bumps, very small, but always shaking. And uh, so you kept, uh, you doze off and you'd wake up, you'd doze off and wake up. <coughs> Gee, the food was really excellent in the plane. I flew Pan Am. Yeah, they were, it really was excellent. Thanks to Dennis King, he arranged for me to come first class. It was really pleasant. They really spoil you. Today we've got the rare occasion to meet a man who's been in uh, in the entertainment business for entertainment business for 30 years, and who's just celebrated his 30th anniversary. And let's have a look first back to the 50s. And I would like to know: Can you describe the musical scene of the 50s? Well, in the beginning years of the 50s. Um I was not uh, working as an artist, uh, arranger, conductor, artist. I was working mostly um, with the bands or at the NBC studios in New York City as a staff conductor, uh, not conductor, staff trombonist, arranger. And I was doing so shows like uh, oh, the, This Is Your Hit Parade. And uh, it was at that Immediately following that period that I started um, uh, as a conductor on my own uh, with, CB, with CBS Records, I was, as a matter of fact, the first, um, the very first uh, time I ever worked as a conductor for CBS Records, I was also working as a trombonist in New York City as a staff trombonist on the NBC Studio Staff Orchestra. And I was doing freelance work as a trombonist arranger throughout New York City. And um, I recall the first time I got an assignment to write as Ray Khan of the conductor, I was sitting in the band in the recording studio, and Mitch Miller was in charge of the session. And it was an artist um, uh, called Don Cherry. And uh, I knew Mitch Miller, and he came out and said hello to me and asked me. I had just gotten into uh, New York. I had, was, as a matter of fact, my family was still out on the West Coast, and I came back to New York City to see what was going on because I wanted. I felt like I wasn't fulfilling all of the work and the uh, and the uh, creativity that that I was capable of. And so I decided to come back to New York City, where I'd been quite successful as a trombonist arranger with the bands. So Mitch came out in the studio and said hello to me and asked me what I was doing in New York. And so I moved back here, and uh, he said, well, I said, you know, if you need uh, an arranger uh, for uh, any of your artists, uh, I'm available. And I left my number with him, with him and he said, um, like they all say, you know, we'll keep you in mind. And, um, but he did that. But uh, that isn't completely answering your question. You asked me what the music was like. Well, there were, there were artists around that were very popular, like Johnny Ray. Uh, Frankie Lane was one of the very popular artists at that time, that era. Elvis Presley. And uh, it was a very exciting uh, period of, uh, of the recording business. And uh, one of the things that I found uh, very exciting about it, and as a matter of fact, I've gone back to this kind of recording, 
and that is that we did everything live in the session at the time, and um, uh, which I think is an art that has become uh, uh, rather lost with the overdubbing technique, you know, where you come in and you make the rhythm tracks, and uh, then the uh, uh, the uh, brass come in and play to the rhythm tracks. They put earphones on and add their part uh, playing to what they hear on the earphones. And then the uh, strings come in and put their part on, listening on earphones and voices. And then finally the soloist puts his part on and sings his solo. Uh, there's, there's something that doesn't happen on the record that used to happen in those days when uh, you would have... Uh, well, like in my case, I had eight singers in those days and 18 musicians, which is uh, 26 people in the studio, uh, 27 with me conducting. And there was a, a spontaneity and an excitement that happened on the recording that doesn't happen with the other technique. Uh, trumpet players don't play the same, and singers don't sing the same when they're listening to earphones uh, as they do when they have the rest of the people surrounding them in the studio and they hear what they're doing and the whole thing becomes one uh, uh, performance. And um, so that was uh, a great era to uh, live through. And even the, uh, the artists of those days were recording in the same manner. And uh, so I, I find it a very, uh, uh, it has been a very wonderful uh, era to pass through. Well, it's been an era where popular, uh, where, where rock and roll was popular. And that was exactly the time when the Conniff sound was born. Weren't you running against all tides? Well, uh, rock and it wasn't only rock and roll that was popular. There were, uh, there were some other uh, artists around uh, similar, like the Les Algart band was, was popular at the time when I started. Um, uh, Billy May, I believe. Well, he might have come a little later. Uh, there were uh, there were other artists. Uh, it wasn't just rock and roll. Uh, Joe Stafford was ma were, was making records at that time. Uh, Rosemary Clooney was still making records. Uh, I mentioned Frankie Lane. Um, I, I guess you might say that. Uh, it was rather unusual that my sound would become popular at this time because the record companies, it was just starting that the record companies were sort of leaning towards rock and roll because they were beginning to find out that for the same amount of dollars that they would put out uh, for a rock and roll session uh, and then a Ray Conniff session that they were uh, more sure of getting their money back and more sure of making money with a rock and roll group. And so if you want to look at it that way, you might say, yes, I was running against the tide. But there were other artists at that time. And, you know, as, as a matter of fact, the first record that I did was not successful uh, uh, with, the, with the Buy in Public. The first record, well, uh, we'd have to go back a little, though, because um, I did records as a conductor for... Uh, backing other artists before I did records as a conductor under my own name. Uh, in the, uh, I think, 55 or 56, I did backings. Well, as a matter of fact, as a result of that meeting with Glenn Miller, uh, Glenn Miller, I wonder what made his name pop into my mind. There's, there's a wonderful name in the music business. He, he certainly uh, uh, established a sound that w w will last forever. But I was thinking of Mitch Miller, and uh, the day, getting back to that conversation with Mitch, with Mitch Miller, where he said, I'll keep you in mind, he did keep me in mind, and two weeks later uh, called me after meeting me on that session where I was playing trombone and asked me to buy, uh, back uh, an artist, a new artist that he had just discovered called um, Eileen Rogers. So I did my first uh, backing for another artist uh, for this girl, Eileen Rogers, and I did two songs for her. And he was very pleased with the way I handled myself as a conductor arranger on the sessions and uh, asked me to do uh, uh, backings for Johnny Ray uh, following that. And that was when we came up with the uh, big hit for Johnny Ray of Just Walking in the Rain. And later, uh, Guy Mitchell, I uh, did a backing for him on, well, many things, but the one you might remember would be Singing the Blues. And then a little later, a year or so later, 
after I had started, as a matter of fact, recording under my own name with my own group, uh, I did the early Johnny Mathis hits like Chances Are, It's Not For Me To Say, and Wonderful, Wonderful. Uh, but uh, let's see, I got a little off here. You, uh, would you refresh my memory on the question? That's one, of, that's one of the things that's hard when you get to be at 30th anniversary, you start forgetting things. Well, I'd be interested in knowing whether there were any obstacles or difficulties yes, to realize uh, your ideas. Well, I, I started to explain, yes, thank you. I started to explain that my first, uh, the first record I did was not successful with the public. Uh, when Mitch asked me, to do my first um, two sides on my own, which was to be a single, I asked him, uh, well, what song do you want me to do? He said, I want you to pick the songs because we had a real good rapport. And um, when we'd be uh, talking over the songs that he would give me for the artists, uh, he would ask me to, uh, he knew I liked to put patterns in the background. And he'd bring me a song, he'd say, put your patterns in. You know, he says, I think that's why you're, your arrangements become successful. I said, well, Mitch, you haven't left any room in this song for the pattern. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, the melody keeps going and the words keep going all through the whole song. There's no room to put any fills. If you want the patterns, you have to leave a, a find songs that have a little room. Well, anyway, he said, when you do, he wanted me to do a single on my own. And he said, uh, pick a couple of songs that you can put your patterns in. So I did some research and I dug out charts for the past 50 years and to find out what songs had been the biggest hits. And I came up with the two songs for the first single would be Begin the Begin and Stardust. These were the most uh, uh, songs that had been recorded the most, that had sold the most records, sold the most sheet music, been most played on radio. And so I did uh, this single on Begin the Begin and Stardust. Well, the Begin the Begin had a very unusual arrangement for those times. And, and I used the uh, group that I, we spoke about, the uh, eight singers, and which I had started using in my backings with other artists. The first time I used the, uh, the singers, uh, by the way, as instruments was in a record, uh, one of the early backings I did for Don Cherry called Band of Gold. So Mitch wanted me to use, that's how he got this idea for me to do this single. He wanted me to do uh, the sound of the voices used as instruments. So I used in Begin the Begin, I started it out, I got an idea for, I always felt rhythm should be very prominent in, in uh, popular music because everything that we do in life is, is uh, associated with rhythm, like uh, our heartbeats and um, uh, our daily life is a rhythm. The sun comes up in the morning and goes down at night. The, the ocean, the tides go in and out. Everything in life is a rhythm, a pulsation. And I felt that uh, rhythm and pulsation should be very important in music. So I started the, the arrangement out with uh, six guitars and uh, bass, drums, and piano, and percussion as a rhythm. And they played a pattern. And then I brought the voices and instruments in on top of that on the introduction with a figure that went bow, 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 and the rhythm would continue. And then I introduced the melody. Ba da 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 da, ba da da, bow, bow, bow. Well, this pattern kept through the whole arrangement. And uh, the Disc jockeys heard this in the United States and later throughout the world, and they thought this was the greatest thing they'd heard for many years. So they started playing this Begin the Begin record on the air day and night, and it just got saturation airplay. But the strange thing about it was the single wasn't selling any records at all. It was selling a few, you know, but nothing like it should have been selling in comparison to the airplay. So uh, the, the uh, fellows in charge of sales at CBS Records couldn't figure out what was wrong with this formula. So it was a fellow by the name of Hal Cook who was head of um, the um, marketing at CBS at that time. By the way, it was called Columbia Records then. I keep saying CBS because today it's CBS. But Hal said at a meeting, I wasn't there of course, uh, uh, it was all the brass of CBS. He said, I think with Ray Conniff, we have an album sound. And I think that if we put out an album of this sound of Ray Conniff, we'll have a successful album. I don't think he is a single artist. Uh, single artists are more for the 
uh, a different generation of, of people that are, are buying uh, Elvis Presley and the Beatles and, and this sort of music. So we did the first album and Mitch called me and asked me to uh, pick 10 other songs besides Begin the Beginning and Stardust for the album. And he wanted me to pick the songs, which I did. Pardon me. And one of the songs was wonderful. So we did the 10 other songs with the same formula. We used to put 12 songs in an album in those days. And the first album came out wonderful. And again, we had the same problem. We had a turntable hit with wonderful in that every disc jockey in the United States was playing this day and night. Many of them used it for a theme song because it was a strange, uh, by coincidence, the last, I had a spot in the arrangement about two thirds of the way through where there was a, a stop and a cymbal crash. And quite by accident from the cymbal crash to the end of the arrangement was exactly 60 seconds, which disc jockeys like for an opening and closing theme. So many, many disc jockeys use this. And in those days, we had a uh, chart in the Billboard magazine, the trade magazine, Billboard. And it was, the chart was called uh, Albums Most Played by Disc Jockeys. And the uh, wonderful album was on that chart for no nine solid months. And there were only 10 albums on this chart. It would be number three, it would be number six the next week, then it would go back to four, then it would go down to eight, and then it would go back up to five, and it moved around on that chart for nine months, but never went off the chart. And after six months, uh, they had another meeting at CBS and said, what's wrong? We're getting all this airplay, and the Conniff album isn't selling. And uh, they couldn't figure it out. And then finally, after six months, it was like somebody uh, uh, said, okay, now you can go buy the album. It finally sunk in that the people had heard it enough that they went in, they started buying it, and then the album did sell, and uh, then all the albums following that were big sellers. What are the ingredients of the new sound, and what made you invent the Conniff sound? Does it come overnight, or how does one create a new sound? The new sound of the 60s, <laughs> the old sound of the 60s, the old new sound of the 60s. Well, uh, you know, uh, in all the years that I have been now recording and, and doing, I've, since recording became popular, I became, it became mandatory to also do concerts, which I had never done before. So in the course of all of this, I've done a lot of interviews. And um, I would love to have been able on all these interviews to be able to say that one night I jumped up and, at 3 in the morning and this idea hit me for this sound, you know, that that uh, became successful back uh, beginning in 1956. But it really wasn't that way at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it's like probably most things of this nature. I guess you pick up little things here and there over many, many years that uh, sort of all finally come together at one time. And I would say it wasn't until probably 10 or 20, 15 years after doing many, many interviews, uh, people asking me how I came upon, you know, the sound that, and I assume what you're saying when you ask about the sound, you're, you're thinking mostly probably of the original sound of the voices used as instruments and, and mixed right in with uh, the brass and, and saxophones. You know, I, I saw the Glenn Miller story. Uh, I was in the Glenn Miller story, by the way. Uh, if you looked real quick, you might see me in that film. And in those days, it were very hard times for me. And um, in uh, hard times, musicians out in California do what we call sideline work for movies. The sideline musicians never play a note. They're just on camera. And I was on camera in the Glenn Miller story. And... Uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart uh, was Glenn Miller, of course, in the story, and um, the, the trumpet player uh, stood up and played a solo, and when he sat down, he had his, still had his horn up to his mouth, which no one ever does. You know, when you're through playing, you take the horn away, and when he came down, he hit the chair, and, and we all stopped playing, and what happened? And I looked back, and that's where my big reaction comes, and I look over my shoulder like that with him you know, horror on my face. So if you look real close, you might see that my first acting days. But anyway, Joey cut his lip is what happened. 
So what are we going to do? Oh, what are we going to do? The whole book is built around Joey and the trumpet solo. So uh, they decided to give it to the, uh, Glenn decided to give it to the clarinet player, and he's going to play lead. So the new sound was discovered for the Glenn Miller sound of the clarinet lead and the saxophone, which wasn't the way it happened at all. But it was like that with me. I think, um, I, as I say, about 10 or 15 years after I had been doing interviews, it dawned on me that probably what uh, caused me to start uh, using that sound of the singers working and u using syllables with instruments was that in the days when I used to work in the bands, bands like Artie Shaw, Bob Crosby, and Harry James, and these different road bands, uh, we would uh, ride many hours in the bus, and uh, from you know doing one night as two, three, four, five hundred miles a night, and uh, while we were riding, we we all used to collect records of the other bands, and uh, while we were riding along, one of the one of the guys would start singing. Uh, uh, or let's say Benny Goodman's arrangement of King Porter Stomp. And we'd sing, then the rest of the guys in the bus would all join in. We'd sing the arrangement through, note for note, you know, trumpet solo, saxophone solos, everything. And using just, so we didn't decide, well, we're going to use ba here and da there or do here, and we just did it, you know. It was just a natural thing to sing certain syllables because that's the way we were. And so I think um, I went, well, like all arrangers, the first time I ever used voices as instruments was on the, the uh, Don Cherry arrangement, the Band of Gold, where I backed uh, this artist, Don Cherry. And uh, I thought, gee, I wonder what that would sound like to, uh, you know, mix singers in on a record with instruments. So uh, I wrote the arrangement, and uh, for an introduction, it had, uh, I used my regular band sound of uh, r rhythm section, and, and uh, I think I had six brass and five reeds like I've been using today. And I started off, and I doubled uh, six men singers in with the instruments on the introduction. It went ba 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 and uh, so Mitch Miller heard this sound mixing in with these voices and instruments and came running out of the booth and he says, Ray, this is a great sound. And that's when he got the idea for me to do that uh, first uh, single, uh, Begin the Begin and Start Us, using the sound of voices and instruments. So uh, that I guess, uh, you know, it, it was just, and, you know, and also I always, I always believed, as I, as I mentioned before in interviews, that Rhythm should be very predominant in music. And of course, I picked up a lot of devices uh, working with all the so-called name bands in the swing band era. So it was really a combination of all of these things, uh, accumulation of knowledge over many years that uh, really uh, brought about the sound, which came out in the first uh, uh, record, uh, Begin the Begin and Start Us, and the first album was wonderful. Anyway, um, after a series of LPs, albums like Wonderful, Marvelous, Soulful Noise, and so on, the sound was instrumental, and you used human voices to dub the instruments. But suddenly there was a change. You, you release, a, a CBS release an album by the Ray Conniff singers. What made you invent them? Oh, well, um, there wasn't too many uh, too much. Well, I don't keep very close. Do you recall the year? It's the Talk of the Town was the first album that. The first, this wonderful command, I think, in, came out in 56, 1956. When did the Talk of the Town come out? 1960. Oh, was that many years later? I thought it was closer. Well, okay, so that's about three or four years later, probably. Well, um, what I discovered uh, during the sessions was that I was using singers uh, quite a bit different than anyone else was using them, in that since I was writing for them mostly to sing right with instruments, it was necessary for them to phrase with the instruments. And I found that this was difficult for singers to do. 
they were not used to hitting notes right on the nose, for one thing. Like if a trumpet player puts a valve down, blows that note, that note comes out ba right on the nose. You know, it doesn't come out ba. You know, they had a habit when they would sing, they'd come up under the note. You know, and I, so I'd have to work on them. Say you can't do that. You got to hit it right on the nose. And um, also, they didn't know how to swing. It, uh, swing was a thing that happened, and it was a term that came up during the Benny Goodman era, it was really invented. And the only musicians that knew how to swing and play swing or, or sing it were musicians themselves, like the guys riding along in the bus with me. So the singers didn't know how to swing. It was a, it was a technique, an approach to, uh, to the rhythms that uh, was just not, you couldn't teach it. You had to go on the road for 10 years and play in a band to be able to do it. So with the first group that I had on a record, I had an awful time getting them to swing because I had to swing to fit with the trumpets and trombones and saxophones. So uh, that was one of my early problems. When I first got the idea of using voices as instruments, I decided they'd have to be very strong voices because you know a trumpet or a trombone or a saxophone is much stronger than a human voice. So I hired legitimate singers which was worse for swinging. They, had, they didn't even know what uh, a Benny Goodman band or an Artie Shaw band sounded like, you know. So that was one of my early problems. But why did you introduce the uh, lyrics then to your record? Oh, uh, well, uh, I found that after we did a, a several of these albums, they were falling into the idea of this swing style, and I thought, well, look, um, why don't I have them sing the words and have them get a beat with the words like, like horns do when they play the words? So I went to Mitch Miller about it, and I told him about it. I said, you know, I think if we got this group in now and had them sing the words, it would be a little different than the average choral group because they have now learned how to swing with the band. And he didn't want me to do it because uh, by this time he had what was called the Mitch Miller sing-along, and he was becoming quite successful in his own right, and he was doing a television show uh, for NBC Studios. So he tried to talk me out of it, and I, w I wouldn't uh, hear of it, and I would still, you know, I was young then, and I, and I, I wasn't afraid to argue with executives. <laughs> I had no fear of being fired because I didn't care if I had the job or not. I just wanted to do my thing, you know. So um, finally he said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll compromise with you. He says, if you'll do one more album uh, uh, like I want you to do, I'll let you do the album with the singers singing the words. And I uh, see, so he said, I want you to do another instrumental album like this wonderful, marvelous, uh, uh, softful, uh, yeah, well, no, it's wonderful, marvelous he mentioned. I said, okay. So we did the, uh, the extra album he wanted, and then we did the album with the words, It's the Talk of the Town. And it did, it, what happened was what I thought would happen. It was a different approach in that the singers hit the notes on the button, they didn't slide into them, and it did have a different sound than any choral group that was around at that time. Uh, by the end of the 50s and early 60s, you were voted most promising band leader for three subsequent years. And, well, you had enormous success with both the singers and the instrumental albums, and you received honors, gold records, and so on. I've got a very personal question. Did the success change the person, Ray Conniff? Oh, I'm sure it did. Uh... I think probably what's at the bottom of your question, though, probably is, did it spoil me? Um, it changed me a lot, of course. Um, it's wonderful to have success, you know, and to have things become successful. It's, it, it gives a very, uh, very nice feeling to a person to know that they are doing something that is appreciated and, and when you get a royalty statement and you see big sales, you know, a lot of people like these albums, enough so to go out and buy them. And, and uh, that has to make you feel good. It, it's nice to uh, feel that you're doing something that is filling a need. Uh, like we in the United States, and I think over here now too, you have uh, 
the McDonald's hamburgers all over the world now. And the, the guy that started that out, he, he supplied a need for the young generation. They really love those things, you know. And it must, anyone that comes up with something like that, I think it's very gratifying. Uh, the danger is, and I'm sure this is what you uh, mean by the question, is you can get a feeling of, of being very important when you do this sort of thing. I think the thing that might have saved me, uh, and I've seen this happen to artists, um, and I'm sure it did change me in that manner to a certain extent, how much it's hard for one to know. You know, you always, we always try to think that we are doing the best that we can and that we're pretty good people, you know. And it's hard for you to judge yourself and to know if you have changed. But I'm sure probably people around me uh, that were close to me at the time probably saw a change in me as well. But I think one thing that was very helpful to me was that I didn't do personal appearances for many years after my albums became successful. Um, there wasn't any real reason for this. It was just that I really didn't want to. I, I didn't want to do that sort of thing. I didn't want to become a television star. Uh, I didn't want to go out and do concerts. Uh, I, I just liked what I was doing. I, liked, I always liked writing arrangements. I loved you know conducting a band when I was in the bands in the days of Artie Shaw and all of those bands. I used to like bringing my arrangements in and I didn't get a good chance to conduct them because usually the band leader was there and I was standing beside him and it was uh, sort of the kind of a thing, well, don't you think this would be better if we, if the tempo was a little slower? Usually, you know, you had to, he was paying the bills and nine times out of 10, he'd beat them off too fast or too slow and you knew the tempo that it was supposed to be played because you created the arrangement. So, um, I, but anyway, um, I didn't do my first concert until out in uh, Los Angeles, there were a, a couple of fellas, Bill Stewart, a disc jockey, and I can't remember the other fellow's name. He was head of a company called Concerts Incorporated. And they came out to my house one day in Encino, when I live in Encino, California, and they wanted me to do a concert at the Shrine Auditorium where they, uh, I think they still have the Academy Awards there and the Grammys. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. And they said, well, why haven't you done any cards? I said, I, that isn't what I want to do. I like to write my arrangements and go in and record them. And, and I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a, besides, I said, you know, who would come to a Ray Khan of concert? Nobody. And they said, well, we think they would. And I, I always thought of a concert as something you go to where you hear uh, Tchaikovsky play, performed, or Beethoven or something like that. And I couldn't see people going to a concert and sitting listening to Smoke Gets In Your Eyes, which was uh, written in kind of a style where people would dance to it. And well, anyway, to make a long story short, uh, to answer your question, I don't think I got spoiled by hearing the acclaim of the crowd. I didn't have anyone coming asking me for my autograph on the street because nobody knew what I looked like. All they knew was that there were Ray Conniff records for sale in the record stores and they wanted them. And uh, so the first time I ever heard that roar of applause when I, was when I did the first concert. Oh, by the way, the reason they knew that people would come to the concert was because when they held concerts, they used to put on the seat of every concert chair out at the, well, like for instance, at the um, Santa Monica Civic Auditorium, which held uh, 2,600 people. When you come in for the concert there, uh, Norman Grant started uh, jazz concerts about this time, and they were booking Norman and uh, jazz concerts. And they would, on each seat, there would be a questionnaire, what artist would you most like to hear in concert? And my name kept coming up on these questionnaires, so that's how they knew. So anyway, I, oh, and finally I said, to cinch the thing about me not doing any concerts, I can't do them because the sound I've created was created in the studio with electronics, with echo, with equalization, and with uh, the balance of the sound. And I said, in order to do that kind of a sound, we would have to have all the recording equipment in the concert hall, and we'd have to have my sound engineers and all of that, and I thought that's gonna end the uh, argument. And they says, we'll do it. So I says, you will? And uh, you mean you'll bring all the sound equipment I have in the studio? So they did. They got my recording engineer, they got stereo sound equipment, we, we call the first concert, concert in stereo. And so, uh, but I think, I don't think I really got 
you know, to the point where, and then I, then I think I was probably affected more adversely, as you say, uh, did it change me. When I walked, the first time I walked on that stage, I was scared to death. I was just fractured. And I thought, because I, first of all, I didn't know why I was even doing a concert. I didn't really believe up until the first note was played that people would want to hear my kind of music in concert. When I walked from the wings onto the stage, there was a roar of applause like I had never heard before in my life. And, I, and it was for me. And, and I, I just, it was like, a, it was unreal. And I couldn't even start playing for about uh, three minutes. And, and I just stood there and I, uh, somebody had showed me how to bow. I took several bows and I turned around and I didn't start because there was too much noise in the place and I turned around again. So then, I mean, I knew that they loved what I was gonna do before I even played a note. So uh, I think if it could have affected me adversely, it would be from that point on. Um, well, then uh, following this uh, concert in Santa Monica Civic Auditorium, the same promoter asked me to do a tour of um, a West Coast tour. And we did cities like San Francisco, went up as far as Spokane, Washington. We did San Diego, California, pardon me. And, uh, and we had, as a matter of fact, we, then we used that title, Concert and Stereo, for the tour. And in the beginning, we ran into a problem with that title because stereo itself was fairly new to the record industry. And when people saw that tagline, they thought, now many of them thought that we were going to do a concert with playing records, stereo records. And nobody could figure out, what does he mean a concert in stereo in a live auditorium? Well, what I meant by it was that I set the band up on the stage the way it was in the recording studio, uh, or what you heard on the records. When you heard my records on those early records, well, still when you hear the records, I had, you hear the saxophones on the left channel, and you hear the piano and the percussion coming out the left channel, and you hear the brass and the harp coming out the right speaker, and you hear what we call the phantom center channel, which means it's on both sides. The singers are come out both, both speakers, so they sound in the middle, and the rhythm, which is, consists of drums, uh, bass, and guitars, uh, also are on both speakers, so they sound in the middle. And uh, so we had to clarify uh, in the publicity after the first few nights that this was a live concert in stereo, or whatever the difference between a live concert. And that's, that's all of the interviews I did. That's all of the, uh, all the interviewers wanted to know was, well, why, do you, why do you want to do stereo in a concert hall? Well, we figured that a live uh, group is stereo. I mean, you're hearing it live. So I would have to explain to them that if you did a concert with uh, brass and singers with no microphones, you wouldn't hear any singers in the concert hall. The, bra the brass would drown the singers out, and so we had to mic everything as we did in the studio. And we used, a, I had an echo device. I had, oh, for the West Coast tour, I had my own sound system built. At that time, uh, there was no stereo sound system for concert performances, so I had a system built between the Santa Monica Civic Con concert when we used the recording equipment and the, uh, that first West Coast tour. Well, so far we've put the emphasis on the 60s, early, uh, late 50s and early 60s, but now let's see how the Ray kind of story goes on. What was the next highlight in your career? The next highlight? Hmm. Um, well, let's see, after the um, after the West Coast tour, of course, I was doing three albums a year at this, uh, all through this period. Um, and in the beginning, uh, after that first album, It's the Talk of the Town with the singer singing the words, uh, we used to do two albums of what I call instrumentals. And, and they used to put on the cover to distinguish instrumentals from ones that had words or vocals. Uh, I don't know if the people ever, it was very clear to the people, but we used to say Ray Conniff Orchestra and Chorus. And that to me meant that there were no words in that record, but there were singers on the record singing syllables with the, with the brass and reeds. And then when it said Ray Conniff and the singers, that to me meant that the singers were featured 
singing the words, and we didn't do any instrumental sounds in that one. So we used to do uh, two uh, of the, what I call instrumental sounds, uh, to one of the uh, singers singing the words. And we did that for quite a few years, up to the point where we did uh, an album called uh, Somewhere My Love. And when we did Somewhere My Love, which was the theme from Dr. Zhivago, the love theme from Dr. Zhivago was the title song of the album. This album became the biggest album that I had ever recorded up to that point in time. So uh, right away, CBS wanted me to do uh, more of that type of album. So we changed the ratio at that point and we would do two of the singer albums with them singing the words and uh, to one of them, uh, of the instrumental sound. And this went on for the next several years. I, th when, I think Somewhere in My Love was 1962, was it? 1964. Uh, something like that. Okay. I'm not very good on dates. But to answer your question about what was the next ex uh, exciting highlight of my life, I would say, I did, a, uh, following the, the West Coast tour, I did a couple of West Coast tours of the United States, and then I did an entire six-week tour of the United States. And I was disappointed in that tour uh, because the tour was not handled by a good promoter. And in my estimation, it wasn't a successful tour, box office-wise. The reason being, it was not properly, properly publicized. And um, so I became a little soured on tours in the United States. The next thing that was very exciting for me was um, I got a call from uh, CBS International who, uh, you know, they're in the, on the CBS records they have two departments. They have what they call CRU, that's Columbia Records United States is how that started, and CRI, which is Columbia Records International. Don't ask me why, but CRI and CRU never shake hands. I, I've never been able to figure out why this is. They are both owned by CBS, uh, the big company that has the television uh, uh, station as well, you know, a television channel. But anyway, I got a call from CRI, Columbia Records International. My records were by, by now being released all over the world, by the way. That's another freak thing I should tell you about. So many freak things have happened to me that uh, have had a great, uh, been very instrumental and big change in my life that were, you know, you can call it by accident or uh, uh, if it's in the stars or what, I don't know. But like one thing, I didn't really go into detail, but the first time I conducted for CBS Records was when Mitch Miller called me in for uh, uh, a backing for a girl called Eileen Rogers. And up to this point in time, I have always been uh, really a tremendous introvert. And um, I would never speak up for myself uh, in, in any group gathering. If there was any gathering of over uh, two people, I was never in the conversation. Um, so uh, this thing came up where Mitch, uh, Mitch said to me, he wanted me to come in and do two arrangements uh, for a British girl called Eileen Rogers for a record session. And it was what they call a split date. There, were, there was another artist going to be on the date, which was, happened to be Don Cherry, who I later did the Band of Gold hit for. But I didn't write the arrangements for this session. So Don was doing two arrangements, uh, two arrangements on the session, and Eileen Rogers was paying, doing two arrangements. Now, the reason for this is because the record company, they have to pay uh, musicians to do four sides. So they one session, they only have to pay the musician once, but they get two songs out of two different artists. Well, anyway, so Mitch gave me the songs. Eileen was there, and I went over them on the piano and figured out the keys for her and everything. And so she had gone, and Mitch says, by the way, you might as well write yourself in a couple of trombone parts and make a few extra bucks on the date. And um, so this is the most unusual question I ever asked in my life because I said to him, well, who's going to conduct? And I mean, normally I would never ask a question like that. I'd just say, okay, I'll write the trombone parts, you know, but obviously I, uh, somebody was going to be conducting those, the, my arrangements. 
So Mitch said, well, I've got Norm Layton, Norm Layton um, hired as conductor for the sessions. In other words, he was going to conduct the Don Cherry sessions, and he wasn't about to pay for two conductors. You pay double scale for conductors. So what he was telling me for, uh, telling me was that if I wanted to conduct on the date, I wasn't going to get paid. But if I'd play trombone, I'd, I'd get paid extra. So, and then, but the, uh, this all happened in fractions of a section, second. So he asked me, uh, I asked him who's going to conduct. He says, well, I've got Norm Layden hired to conduct. And right away he said, why, would you like to conduct? And I said, well, yeah. So a conductor became born in three sessions, uh, three questions, uh, three statements over of what, uh, 15 seconds. And how it all came about was that I had gone through a very slow period in my life out in California. And to occupy my time, I was studying piano and I was studying composition orchestration, self taught out of my own books. I didn't have teachers. And I was studying the, uh, out of a book called The Grammar of Conducting. And what you do with The Grammar of Conducting is a book and you open it up to page one and the first thing it tells you to do is to get a, a stick, conductor stick, which I made out of a sliver of wood myself, because I was really broke. And then it tells you to put up a big mirror and stand in front of a mirror. Well, we had an old mirror in the garage, so I, I put this mirror up in the garage, and I, I had built myself a little cubby hole of a room out of uh, two by fours and cardboard boxes with the walls. I had insulated walls of cardboard. And so I stood in front of, and I had a little beat up piano in there that I got for 25 bucks. And so I would stand in front of this. Um, uh, mirror and play symphony records and I'd have the score and I'd conduct the score. So I had been studying uh, conducting. So when he said, why do you want to conduct? I was quite ready to say, well, yeah. So anyway, I, I conducted on that first session uh, for Eileen Rogers. The two songs we did were Now is the Time and Just a Little Bit More. If anybody has that record, that would be a collector's item. Columbia or CBS Records had a uh, policy when I first recorded for them in 1956, my first album's wonderful. They had a policy that as a shot in the dark, let's say, they would send a uh, reference copy or a, a tape copy to all of their affiliates. And they were had affiliates throughout the entire world. So when the Ray Conniff's uh, wonderful album came out, they did this, they began getting immediate response from all over the world. We want the Ray Conniff album. Nine out of, maybe 99 out of 100 of these things they would send to Brazil, Germany, uh, France, uh, Africa, Japan, what have you, wouldn't be interested in, a, in an American album because most of them had the English words. It was practically all vocals. But here comes a guy with vocals, a chorus, vocal sound, which, uh, Seen that everybody loves all over the world, and songs of George Gershwin, Cole Porter, songs that they love all over the world, but no language barrier. So they all wanted the Ray Conniff album, and they released it. It was released practically throughout the whole world and became successful throughout the whole world. And as a matter of fact, I was the first artist that. Uh, CBS Records to receive what they call the Crystal Globe Award, which is award they gave, they give or still give. I think they've given about ten of them out date of this taping uh, for a sale of over five million albums through uh, in countries other than the United States. So uh, there again was a complete freak thing. I didn't. Uh, start a sound of voices used as instruments because I thought this would be a great idea for the whole world because there'd be no language barrier, you know, with just a sort of a, a thing that happened to me. And it's been like that uh, throughout my whole career. And you know, you asked me earlier, uh, what were the next exciting things that happened in my life? And I would have to say that the, one of the real highlights uh, as far as excitement and exhilaration, let's say, out of the uh, entertainment business. You know, it, it's, it's great fun to sit at home and write arrangements and do three, uh, three albums a year, and uh, every six months get a royalty statement and see how many records you sold with a nice check with it. That's fun too, you know, you can buy cars and houses and all that stuff. 
But it's not like going on a stage and actually hearing real people react to what you do. It's an entirely different thing. And uh, the first time I mentioned that I had that was uh, before was at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium uh, concert, and then later a follow-up of a West Coast tours and the United States. But I think one of the uh, uh, things, well, there were two real uh, concerts that nothing could compare to. And the first one was in Brazil in 1962. I got a, a phone call through CBS, a man by the name of Augusto Massagal, who was a promoter in, uh, oh, or was at this time, 1962 in Brazil, wanted to know if Ray Conniff would come to the Rio de Janeiro Song Festival and perform no, no, they didn't even ask me to come perform. They wanted me to come as a judge. I, that sounded like fun. I talked it over with my wife, and she thought it'd be fun, too. And uh, so we said, okay, let's go. So um, about two days before I was going, I got a call from Henry Mancini. He said, Ray, it's Hank Mancini. I said, oh, hi. And I'd had, had hardly, I, you know, hardly, well, we know each other, and we've met and everything, but we're not buddy-buddy, you know. He lives out in California as well, and I was living there at the time. He says, I call you, he said, because I wanted to tip you off to something. He said, you know, I was supposed to go to that song festival and be a judge as well, and I can't go. I have concert commitments. And he says, my, my boy is going to go in place of me. And he says, I called to tell you to bring a few arrangements along. He said, do yourself a favor and bring a few arrangements along. He says, because they're going to ask you to perform. He says, I know they will. And he says, be prepared. So I said, well, okay. So I did. I brought Somewhere My Love, Brazil, and Besame Mucho and stuck them in the bag parts. And I went down, and sure enough, uh, when I, got, I was introduced to Augusto Mazagal, he said, well, you know, Ray, we invite you down here as a judge, and that's all. He spoke good English, so that's all you have to do. And he said, but, you know, if you'd like to perform, uh, we'd love to have you perform with our... Uh, orchestra and chorus. And I said, well, how many singers do you have? And he said, we have six singers. And I said, well, I use eight singers. He said, we'll get you two more. So, And I said, uh, also, I don't have any uh, string parts. And he said, well, you want to write some string parts? You can use them. If not, you don't have to. Well, anyway, make a long story short, I rehearsed the singers. I rehearsed the eight singers. I mean, it took me two days to get three songs down. It was, it was oh God, it was horrible. And I, I wrote, added some string parts to the three arrangements I had, and I, and I performed them at this song festival in Rio de Janeiro, which was in an auditorium, a closed auditorium, the whole 30,000 people. And I tell you, it was the highlight of, highlight of my whole career, without a doubt. I have never been so... Uh, they were just wild, and they, they just loved what we did. As a matter of fact, there was a rock star that was there on the show, and they had staged a thing for him, and he came on. I wasn't in the contest. I was just an added artist to perform. There was a rock artist uh, who was to perform after me on the show, and the promoters had staged the thing, and they'd, hip, they'd given about 100 girls uh, carnations, and they were sitting down front, and they were supposed to throw the carnations to the rock star. And at, I did the first song, Besame Mucho, and I'll tell you, it was bedlam. They, they, the whole audience was going back, swaying and rhythm with the music, the whole thing, and clapping, and they, were, they just loved it. And at the end of Besame Mucho, there was practically a standing ovation, and the hundred girls threw their carnations up on the stage for me, and they had to go get some more carnations for the rock star when he came out. So I did, I did uh, Besame Mucho, and then we did Somewhere My Love, and you can imagine what happened when I closed with Brazil. It, it was the wildest thing I've ever heard in my life. And um, that has happened to me one other time in, you know, all concerts always go well with me, especially in South America, but in uh, Rio de Janeiro, and uh, I, later I did a song festival in Viña del Mar, Chile, and, and did the same thing. At uh, that time, I brought my own singers, and those were the two highlights, the most exciting nights of my whole uh, career. Both your popularity and your activities were not restricted to the United States. What other countries did you go to? Well, the uh, South American countries and the Latin countries, my music became very strong and has remained very strong. 
and even stronger to this day. As a matter of fact, I now do uh, one album a year just for the Latin countries. And the countries I have visited, uh, did you ask I visited to or released? Visited? Well, act, act, activities. Active, you mean like performing? Uh, performing. And stage, uh, okay, the countries, I've done a tour in Japan. Oh, I'd say about six times I've been to Mexico. I've been to Brazil about four times. I'm going there again this year, which is 1986 now. I've been to Chile about three times. I've been to Argentina twice. These were concert uh, tours. I've been, to, uh, well, I did the tour of Germany back, I think it was in 1962. Uh, and I've been to many countries where I didn't perform in song, you know, in tours, but I, well, I did a tour of England, uh, two tours of England. I performed in Spain for television audiences, and I performed a live performance at a song festival in Mallorca, Spain. I performed at the San Remo Convention in, um, Song Festival in uh, Italy, San Remo. Oh, let's see, what else? Uh, Oh, Russia. I went to Russia and recorded an album there. Um, that's all I can think of at, at the moment. Well, that's very international, isn't it? Anyway, uh, who are your fans? Who are my fans? Yes. You mean the people that buy the records? Mm -hmm. um, well, it varies, I think. Um, I have, uh, I have two different kinds of fans. I think I have, I have fans that are uh, very avid fans that um, will do nothing but um, they know more about me than I know about myself. They know all of my uh, every recording I've ever made. They they know every artist I've ever backed. They know every band I've ever played in. Uh, they will they put out newsletters and they will tell about things that I have forgotten about and uh, uh, they will come to visit California and ask permission to go through my garage and my old boxes of all my old junk and and uh, and uh, rearrange everything nicely for me. It's not very neat out there. And uh, then I have the fans that just buy records, uh, you know, uh, which I would call, I guess, is what you're talking about. They're not crazy like this other bunch, you know, <laughs> that are really fanatic about Ray Conniff and his, what he has done. But I love them, and um, it's uh, very touching to me that there, that there are people that, that think that much about me. Like at the moment of this interview, I, I lugged uh, back uh, three... Uh, 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 cans of 16 millimeter film that weigh about 40 pounds, and I built a, a wooden box to uh, and bolted it together so that we I could bring them over here without them being destroyed or destroying my bag and my clothing. And um, it is very touching to me that there are people that are that impressed by what I've done that they want to uh, preserve it through the years and. Uh, uncover everything I've done. Uh, things like a, a single record that I had completely forgotten about with um, Merv Griffin. I don't know if you have his television show over here. Uh, it was called uh, Getting the Hang of the Meringue, which was a dance. And uh, they reminded me of that one and many others that I complete. As a matter of fact, people always would come up to me and say that um, they would always ask me, how come in all the years you've uh, recorded, you never recorded anything with Frank Sinatra? And I would always say, well, uh, I know, I guess we just never got together. We never on the same sound stage together or something like that. And lo and behold, they informed me that I had made two sides with Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I guess it was back in the days when I used to drink a little too much. I haven't done that for many years now. But anyway, it was with Harry James Band, uh, by the way. And the reason I forgot, I was excused for myself forgetting about it, because it would have been a very important occasion for me to record with Frank, because I'm one of his admirers. Uh, and uh, the reason I had forgotten about it was that Frank was not on the sessions. Uh, we did the sessions, Harry and I did the sessions, and Frank w was not able to come to the sessions, so they overdubbed his voice 
uh, at a later date. And that was one of the first times that had been done, uh, putting a singer on when the, uh, by not being present on the session. But anyway, then I have the, the fans that uh, I guess, um, I don't get a lot of fan mail. I, I would say I get, oh, what would it be? Uh, I probably get a letter about um, every two or three days, you know. So that's what, about uh, maybe 10 letters a month, something, 10 or 15 letters a month. And uh, as a matter of fact, of late, there's been a lot of fan mail, and I, I couldn't figure out what was going on, and it's coming to my house. And um, finally, I started writing back to these people, how did you have my, where'd you get my home address? And uh, I got an answer back from somebody, someone put a book out with my home address in it. And so it, it has become available to people. I get letters from people that run what they call celebrity auctions, and they want you to send uh, anything, a, a button off your coat or a belt buckle or anything, and they'll auction it off, a picture, an album, autograph, whatever you have. I get one of those at least uh, every month or every two weeks. And um, I have a big Latin following. I can't walk down the street in Los Angeles without Someone saying, "Hey, Rye." They call me Rye, Rye Connie, Rye Connie. The, uh, the we have a very heavy La uh, Mexican population in in uh, Los Angeles. And I, as a matter of fact, Vera and I, Vera being my wife, have we have a lot of fun when we go to South America. It, it's uh, it's wild. It's like uh, it's like um, um, Elvis Presley w would have been in in England or the United States. They they spot me and they follow me in droves and they, I'm trying to walk and trying to take very shopping and I'm trying to sign autographs and I'm trying to make my way through the crowds and we'll go in a restaurant and there'll, there'll be uh, 300 people standing outside looking like this, you know, trying to look in to see where we're sitting. And, um, uh, what age group is it? What? What age group? That is a strange thing. Now, uh, Latin America is, is much different than any other where I, place I go in uh, Latin countries in general, Brazil as well. Uh, it's all ages. It's a very strange thing. I'll have a, uh, like I was walking in the park last time I was in Mexico in Alameda Park, and a, and a lady came up to me. She was 85 years old, and she wanted my autograph, and she had all my albums. And she was so tickled to death to, to see me. And they know me down there because I do a lot of television in Mexico. There's a fellow by the name of Raul Velasco. He has a show called Siempre and Domingo. And he's syndicated throughout all the Latin countries. So they spot the white beard, all the Latins. And so they know me when I go out walking. And then by a while, I'm talking with her and signing an autograph. Uh, there'll, there'll be a little kid who'll go by um, uh, no higher than, you know, that five years old, and he say, Rai Connie, Rai Connie, and say to his father, and he say, oh yeah, Rai Connie, they'll pick, they'll pick their babies up and they want me to kiss their babies. I don't know whether I'm supposed to make them have a well life for the rest of life or what. But it's, it's um, in, that, in the Latin countries, it's all age groups. Are very, and I've watched at the, um, at the um, concerts too to look, and I, I have a thing I like to do at, at concerts after, if I possibly can, I like to sign autographs, and I go out back on the stage and sign, and I, it, it's, it's fun for me to see the age uh, groups of the people that come up. So in there, it's all ages. In the United States now, uh, Vera always gets mad at me when I, when I say this, but you know, time goes on and things change, and I really don't like what I see happening in the record business in the United States. I'm not really sure what's happening in Germany, because I'm not that into it here. But in the United States, uh, there's one thing the record companies are interested in. I think it's called the bottom line. And they found that by putting out uh, rock artists, and uh, well, I won't mention them. I'm sure you know who they are. Uh, they don't really seem to care about the content, the lyrical content of the material. Uh, they don't care uh, uh, if it excites young people or if it if it uh, doesn't influence them for good. And uh, I, this, this kind of bothers me in the record business. I think in the Latin countries, uh, it has remained the, um, 
the way it used to be in the United States. Uh, I think the families are closer there, and, and I think that's the reason that all age groups uh, like my music uh, still in, in the Latin countries because, you know, mom and dad say, now, now here's a, here's a, it's okay for you to listen to that rock group, but here's something you should listen to also. This is Ray Conniff, or this is uh, uh, Frank Sinatra, or this is Glenn Miller, and, they, and the radio stations will play all, all different records too. And, but I'd say in the United States that my, the people that remember me, they call me a leg legend now, uh, are, you know, uh, people, uh, well, from, see, when I started out, the record club used to do uh, research on the age group that bought my records, because they liked to know how to aim their advertising. And at that time, the brunt of my buying, uh, my age group that bought my albums was from 18 to 35. Now, I came out and, you know, the first album came out in 1956. And I was very, very strong in the United States, I'd say, for, uh, well, a good 10 years, very strong, which is very unusual for an artist. I remember when I first uh, recorded, I thought, well, if I last for 10 years and still sell records, I'll figure I'm lucky because this is a very f fickle business and it keeps changing. So if you want to do some arithmetic and figure out what those people, how old uh, those people would be now. So, you know, it's the, in, that, in that part of the world, that's the uh, brunt of my fans. But then there are also, uh, there are young people too that seem to like uh, the older things and the older sounds and music and the older songs. Um, I feel the record companies in the United States make a mistake. I think there is a, is a good market for the uh, type of songs that I recorded in those days, the Gershwin, Cole Porter type songs. And uh, I think they miss that market and only because there's a faster way to make money. And I think this is not the right way to run a good business. I think you should uh, reach all of the people and expose all of the people to all kinds of music if you're going to run a record company. and you. And uh, that's the way it used to be, and I think that's the, a good way to do it. It's not, I have to admit, it's not as sound business practice as just selling to people where you can make the most money. But I, I don't know, is that all there is in life, is money, you know, or is, uh, or is it kind of important to do what Edison intended when he first invented the phonograph, to bring entertainment into people's lives and their homes? And I, th I think these, uh, these kind of things uh, mean more in the long uh, run in life than uh, how much money it can make and uh, the bottom line at the company. Well, anyway, uh, let's go on with the present situation. Who selects the repertory? Well, on the repertoire for the albums, in the beginning, in the, um, in the early days, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, I was given a free hand on what to uh, select to go in the albums because I was chosen to do albums because I was being very successful as a background arranger for other artists at Columbia CBS Records. So uh, at that time, 50, 1956, Mitch Miller being head of the company thought, gee, this, let's have an, if we're going to have something done by this guy, let's let him do what he, what he would get into and, and do the best because he is an arranger and, and uh, let's give him let him work on things that he likes to work on, it's, and then the best will come out in him. He was a very smart man in that way, and he made many artists that way. Uh, uh, he was responsible for the success of uh, uh, people like Doris Day, uh, Frankie Lane, uh, Johnny Mathis. Now, as time went on, uh, like with all artists, I don't remember what year, I remember at the, at the year I'm talking about, This Is My Song was uh, number one on the charts. So if you can remember when that was, about that time, at, at that time, there suddenly was detected a, a little sloping off in my sales. So uh, at the time, I was working with a producer called Jack Gold. And Jack came up with the idea, regardless of what you read in Clive Davis' book, he came up with this idea. <laughs> Clive claimed later on that he came up with the idea. Jack came up with the idea of having Ray Conniff record today's hits. 
which, as I say, uh, at that time, uh, This Is My Song was number one on the charts by Petula Clark. I know, well, yeah, Petula Clark, I think, sang that. Yeah, I think so. Charlie Chaplin wrote the song. And um, so we did, we got, uh, and those, by this time we were doing 10 songs in an album. So we got nine other songs together and we put out the album, This Is My Song. And lo and behold, he was right. The uh, sales of the Ray Conniff albums uh, at least doubled, probably tripled. So uh, we thought, uh, good. I was doing three albums a year still, two or three. And uh, so, well, it worked once, let's do it again. So we did it again and it worked uh, about as well. I don't remember the second one. Um, but the problem was that they thought, well, if it works with Ray Conniff, why don't we try it with Andy Williams? His sales are dropping, too. And why don't we try it with Johnny Mathis? His sales are dropping. And why don't we do it with Percy Faith? His sales are dropping. So suddenly, <laughs> here are four or five artists at CBS Records, and they're all recording the same songs. And that where we're getting our sales from are disc jockey airplay, and the disc jockeys were getting kind of annoyed with all of these artists coming out with the same song. So they got mad at all of us and would only play the originals. So it, the whole thing backfired on us. Right now, uh, my biggest sales are now in the Latin countries. They have remained faithful to Ray Conniff sound and more so. Uh, I'm still selling everything I do down there, I get a gold album for, and I'm still selling just about as many albums as I ever sold in any time in my career, but uh, most of them are now in the Latin countries. And so I have to rely upon their choice of material because they know the markets. I'm recording albums from markets that I am not familiar with. The CBS International in the United States will send telexes out. We're ready to do another Ray Conniff album. What would you like him to record? So they'll get a telex back from Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Peru. Oh, by the way, I left that country out when you asked where I had performed. I performed in Peru as well, Lima, Peru. Uh, and so they will, uh, they say, don't send us back just 10 songs, send us 20. So they try to pick 10 out of the answers they get from all the countries, and that's what I will record for, for that uh, uh, next uh, Latin album. However, we have one coming out now that is called the 30th Anniversary Album since I've been with CBS for 30 years uh, at this time. And uh, for this album, they are doing what I would like to do, and that's an album of standards. And uh, standards that are known in all of the different Latin countries, songs like uh, La Compresita, Hernando's Hideaway. By the way, I did an interesting thing in that. I don't know if you remember an album I did some time ago, uh, uh, called So Much In Love, where I mixed two songs together, had the same song going at the same time. I discovered in two of the songs that they wanted me to record, Hernan's Hideaway and uh, La Compresita, that they both had the same, exact same chord background. So I, I did that in that, in that one uh, cut. I put the two together, we have both songs, one going against the other. Um, then we did The Peanut Vendor, um, Yours, uh, let's see what else. Perfidia, Sibane, uh, Bahia, um, April in Portugal. In other words, they are all songs that are very well known uh, practically throughout the world, I would say. And um, I'm, I'm very excited about this album because uh, this is the kind of uh, song that I can tackle the best because uh, I think the older... That's one thing I... Uh, sometimes in interviews they ask me what I think of today's music. Uh, music has had quite a change. The younger writers, not all the younger writers, but a large percentage of the younger writers have forgotten how important the melody is. Uh, to me, music is really three basic elements. It's rhythm, harmony, and melody. And uh, it bothers me a bit, so many of the younger writers, they just go all out rhythm, you know, 90% rhythm, and they have harmony in there. and I mean, the melody is no longer important, it seems to them. I, again, I say, I qualify that with exceptions. Uh, but these older songs, or oh, like, for instance, the songs I've done on the classics are a great example. If you take uh, Tchaikovsky's love theme from Romeo and Juliet, if you play one finger on the bass line and one on the melody, you have practically a whole composition. 
You don't have that with today's music, with the younger people. They don't, the bass today is used as a rhythm instrument, not as a, as a foundation for the chord and something to move uh, contrary to the melody many times and back and forth and weave in and out. And it's a, a pleasing sound that to the human ear that is being forgotten by the younger people, the younger composers. And um, so this, uh, this album, I asked them again to pick the songs they would like to have, but now they're picking from old standards and you can't go too far wrong. And it gives me a chance to get my little patterns in and my little, I call them hooks in the arrangement, you know, the recurring uh, things, the little identifying things in an arrangement. So I'm very excited about this album. As a matter of fact, I'm uh, now working on CBS in New York, uh, uh, trying to pressure them into letting this be the next release. They promised me a 1987 release following the Say You, Say Me 1986 release. So I'm uh, hoping that we might uh, get this to be a United States release. What sort of music do you listen to in your leisure time? In my leisure time, I don't listen to music. I get away from music. Are there any favorite acts? Uh, but I, I should say one thing, though. Uh, I don't want people to think I don't like music because I don't listen to it in my leisure time. Uh, but I hope you'll understand that if you're a painter, you don't go home and paint the house when you're on your weekends if you can get out of it, you know. Uh, uh, I do love music, and I do love to listen to music. Um, as a matter of fact, I just got a lot of fun out uh, this last week, just before I came over here. Um, I have a new, uh, a new clarinet player I'm going to use on the uh, Brazil tour, which we're doing uh, in, a, in about a week. Uh, his name is John Bambridge, he's a great friend of mine. He works on The Tonight Show, if you get that over here, The Johnny Carson Show. He's a great jazz clarinet player, and Skeet Herford isn't going with me on this tour. so. I wanted to present him because I think the, the people are going to be expecting Skeets because he's been with me so many years on tours that I want to give this fellow a fair chance. So I got the idea of featuring him on a number. So what I picked was Let's Dance, the Benny Goodman theme. And so I got Benny's, uh, uh, went out and chased down three or four old Benny Goodman records that had Let's Dance in it. And uh, I just love the way Benny plays. I love the old Benny band. Uh, I, I mean, I can sit and listen to that and not feel like I'm working. You know, it's fun for me. So I did, by the way, I did write it out for John. So it'll be on the, uh, on the next uh, tour. If you get a chance to get anybody do a live uh, recording of that, uh, you'll hear him playing that. And I, I put a few of my, little, my own little innovations in and an ending on it. Um, I love Louis, Louis Armstrong. I have Louis Armstrong records at home. I love to listen to Louis. You know, Louis was such a great musician, and Louis wasn't a school musician. He wasn't the kind of a musician I am where I studied, and, you know, I know when I'm uh, playing some chord, I know the name of the chord. But Louis, when I listen to his old records, uh, I will hear him playing uh, a, a song, and uh, I'll hear the rhythm second section chunking along on a chord, and when they come to the end of the eight bars, where there's a little turnaround to go back into the next eight bars, I'll hear Louis go through a progression of chords that the rhythm section didn't, aren't playing. They didn't hear it. He heard it, and he'll play all the notes in this chord, and it'll be just beautiful, you know. And but the guys, they didn't, they didn't catch on to what he was doing, and, but he was uh, he just had such a beautiful ear, and his time was so. Flawless. I never did like Louis singing. People get mad at me about that. I never liked to hear Louis sing. But, uh, I mean, he had a great beat when he sang, and he was, uh, uh, he was sincere. But I, I just love his trumpet playing so much that I wish he would play all the time. You know, I would give up every singing chorus to have him play that chorus. But uh, let's see. What I, I love Tchaikovsky. I think Tchaikovsky was one of the greatest melody writers of all time. I just love his melodies, and as I say, his writing, com his complete writing, and the way he orchestrated, and the way, he, oh, his bass lines were so great, you know, it's it, it such a, I don't know why the young people don't realize how important the bass line is in music. They just, it, the bass line and the melody are the two most important things. Uh, Victor Young was a great melody writer. I love uh, the late, Vic, well, I say late, it's not so late anymore. Things like uh, Stella by Starlight, um, um, 
can't think of any others at the moment. I think Henry Mancini is one of the most, well, he's, I say, underrated in that I think he's thought of as a more of a pop, uh, in, in today's idiom of uh, pop music. Uh, well, shouldn't use words like pop because uh, people have put meanings to these uh, terms now. Uh, today's type, of, I think uh, what I'm trying to say is Henry is comparable to Tchaikovsky and Victor Young as a melody writer. I think few of us have this gift of uh, great melody writing. I don't have it. I wish I had it. Uh, it's just a gift that uh, not too many have. So if I were going to listen to music at home, oh, Ver and I like to listen to um, or like a Rubinstein uh, playing uh, Chopin, a record of Rubinstein playing Chopin. And um, I, she doesn't, you know, she's not into jazz like me, but I love uh, the artists I've mentioned. Well, we learned you, you're a very busy man. And, well, perhaps there are some other leisure time activities or hobbies. And isn't there little time only for your family? Too little time. It's true, there is too little time for the family. It's strange though, because it seemed like just in the last uh, uh, a couple of years, you would think that uh, by now I would be semi-retired and doing less uh, at this period of my life, but I seem to be doing more. I think the reason for that is, though, um, Ver and I made a decision uh, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, that we were going to simplify our life. And uh, at that time, at one time I had a, a, an office at a separate location with uh, uh, three people full-time working. And I cut that down to uh, one person. And then we decided here, as I say, a few years back, a few years back, that we were going to cut activities even more. So. We uh, closed the office, the separate office, which was a two-room suite, and we built an extra room over our garage where my crazy fan club went through. Uh, that's, a little, that's a little joke on the side because they're here at this taping. Uh, uh, and uh, we put this office over, over the garage and we moved all of the files. By the way, I, I wish you could see my file cabinets of the arrangements I've done. When I look at that file cabinet, I get tired. It, take, it covers a whole wall. I've done, uh, well, now I think I just finished the 75th arrangement. And you know, averaging, uh, well, in the early days, there were 12 songs to arrangement not, uh, to an album. Now, uh, I say uh, uh, 75 albums, I should say. And uh, you know, 10 to 12 songs to an album. And then singles on top of that. And here are all these arrangements filed in this filing cabinet, all this work I did. Uh, but anyway, um, what we didn't foresee was <laughs> that the office used to answer the fan mail, the office used to take care of the bills, the office used to go over the royalty statements, and, and we find ourselves now doing more work. She's working in the office, she pays the bills. Uh, I answer the fan mail uh, personally uh, with very brief uh, uh, answers to it, if they require uh, an answer. If they don't require an answer, I don't answer them because, gosh, you know, you've got uh, so many hours in the day, and if you answered every letter that came and every and everybody that writes to you, it, it takes time. Uh, so, yes, it's true. I am not spending as much time with the family as I would like to, and I keep vowing that I'm that I'm going to stop this, but I don't know, it's hard to stop because, well, like this, uh, what we're doing today, I have two very dear friends um, at, at um, radio uh, station Rias in Germany. Uh, they asked me if I would come over for this gala evening, and, uh, you know, I, it's uh, 5,000 miles to come, and I don't do it for the money, I don't need money anymore, uh, I do it for two reasons, because they are good friends of mine. They've done a lot for me. Uh, the, the gentleman head of Rios, uh, Rudy Piska, uh, is a Ray Conner fan, just like the fan club, you know. And uh, when he asks me if I'll come and do something, I don't ask him how much money he's going to pay me. I say, when is the date, you know. And uh, so things like, in a long year in this business, more things like that start happening. You don't just go out and do a concert tour because 
uh, you want to go to Brazil to uh, sell albums because I, I don't uh, Brazil now I have such economic problems that I hardly get any money from Brazil from the record sales anymore by the time it goes through the exchange rate uh, from cruceros to dollars and um, they leave it in the bank in Cruceros for a year and a half to earn the interest before they send it to me. I don't, you know, in 100% inflation, uh, I don't know if it's a month or when it is, it's terrible. But anyway, I go because I'm a very dear friend of the promoter, Manuel Palladian, who, who uh, and he does a wonderful job of promoting my tours. He fills all the auditoriums. The people love it when I go there. They love the music, and they're really going because they love what I'm doing. So it's it's really hard to cut down. You get sort of trapped. Uh, uh, and uh, I would, I would uh, uh, what do we try to do? We try to arrange the uh, tours so that uh, Vern Tamara can come with me. And what we try to do when a promoter calls, I say, well, can you do it around Easter, or around Thanksgiving, or around, uh, you know, Fourth of July, when we have a like a week holiday in the United States, so at least the family can be with me uh, for that uh, period of time. But I'll tell you uh, where we kind of make up for it, though, is we have a a large uh, motorhome. It's a twenty-eight foot motorhome, which in uh, German terms would be what three into twenty-eight is uh, what uh, eight? No, nine. Nine meters. About nine meters. And, you know, it has a bathroom, it has, uh, we have bunk beds, the upper and lower, Vera sleeps in the lower bunk and Tamara in the upper bunk. It has a kitchen, a stove, a uh, microwave oven, a um, bath, a little bathtub. I can't, I, if I take a bath in it, I'm like this, but Vera does pretty well. I take a shower and, and um, um, we could sleep in a pinch if you wanted to come along. We could let's see, we'd sleep two in the bunk beds. Uh, well, uh, then there's a, a bed over the driver that comes down. That's uh, two, three. Then the, there has a sofa that opens up to two, so that's four, five. And then the dinette can make into a bunk, so that could sleep two kids if it had to be. So that'd be seven. We can a pinch. We can sleep. But anyway, we go with the three of us and three dogs. We have a um, Two uh, French poodles and, um, and a Labrador. And so that's where we have the family fun in the motorhome. And uh, we just completed uh, a long, uh, about a month trip in that. From When they came back from Switzerland, we went from Boston to California in the motorhome. So that's when we have our, uh, our best family times in the motorhome. And as I say, hopefully they can come on the tours. You answered most of my questions so far. And actually, this can be the official end of the interview. I would like to come back to one more item. Uh, this question concerns the old bodies. You happen to get to know in the big band era, like Billy Butterfield and John Best and so on. Do you still meet them? Are you still in touch with the bodies you happen to get to know in the big band era? Uh, not too many of them. Uh, a few of them. I. And, and, you know, when I say I'm in touch, I don't mean that, you know, we talk every other day. I, I went to a uh, 50th sort of reunion thing of the Bob Crosby band uh, last year. Uh, Gus Bavono, who played uh, lead alto in the Bunny Bergen band, uh, I talked with him occasionally when one of the uh, lead alto or clarinet men that normally go with me can't go. I usually check with him. He never has been able to go yet. Talked to Georgie All, saxophone, tennis saxophone player, uh, last time about a year ago. Uh, Billy Butterfield, I talked to, it's funny you would ask, just about a week ago, because uh, I, I, I think Billy is one of the greatest trumpet players we have ever had. And um, so I like to I have hopes that I might be able to do another album with him sometime before they, uh, they put us eight feet under. But uh, I don't know if it'll ever materialize because, like I say, um, the record record companies aren't my, uh, well, you know, they don't do albums like that just because it'd be a great thing to do and maybe I'd only sell, what, 20,000 albums. I don't know what we would sell, Billy and I. Uh, but it would be a terrific thing to do another album with Billy, uh, just for the record. 
Um, uh, let's see. Well, we had, uh, I'm trying to think of things that happened. A lot of funny things happened in those days. Uh, well, Billy, uh, for, you know, uh, there were a lot of sad things, too. Many of us drank too much, so I'll have to tell you that. Uh, drugs weren't too prevalent in the days I was with the bands. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I learned with qu quite a bit of surprise uh, at one point, oh, it was quite a few years back, that a drummer in the Artie Shaw band was on uh, uh, heroin. And, you know, to me, he was just a normal guy to me, nice guy, really, really very nice guy. And uh, one day I read in the baby got busted for having heroin. So it wasn't prevalent, and if, it, if anybody was using it, it, you know, it was quite a secret because it was really taboo, even in the music business, you know. At least uh, the bands I worked with, I, you know, I didn't work with all the bands, but I worked with uh, Bunny, I worked with Artie Shaw. Marijuana was prevalent uh, and uh, was spoken about and used, I would say, probably, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe 50% of the guys in each band would use it on occasion, you know, and... But it wasn't something that was uh, taken tremendously seriously, you know, uh, it, to the point where it led into uh, other things that caused uh, real problems where they were hooked on, a, on chemicals and uh, couldn't recover. But uh, as I say, there were, you know, sad things about those days. There was one thing you have to remember about the bands, and I suppose it's that way in today's uh, entertainment scene. There was a lot of boredom. Uh, you mean... Uh, you have to, in those days, we used to do mostly one-nighters, one-night stands, you know, and the jumps were far apart, and, in the, in the, and the transportation was by bus, and it was complete boredom for many, many hours a day in the bus. So many of the fellas, including me, uh, took to uh, uh, drinking to pass the time. Some would have a bottle and pass it, and so... Uh, but anyway, uh, I'll preface this story with the, son, the funny side of the things were that some of the things that happened... Uh, Billy Butterfield made me think of it. As a matter of fact, if any of you have the album Conniff Meets Butterfield, uh, it's a pose with us on the front cover of the album, and we're both doubled up in uh, laughing, and the guy snapped the picture when we were breaking up with it, and what had happened was he reminded me of this story, and we both broke up at the end of the story. We were playing the Hartford Theater, Hartford being in Connecticut, in the United States, New Year's Eve, and of course, a New Year's Eve show would start uh, just before midnight sometime so that you'd see the New Year in during the show. Well, this was kind of a drinking band, the Bob Crosby band, so you can imagine the condition everybody was in at midnight on New Year's Eve. The band was, was uh, really pretty stoned. So after the show, which would be like one o'clock in the morning, we went up to the dressing rooms and um, and this is typical of the type of thing that would happen. So we had a, a habit in those days in the, in the bands. Everybody had a nickname. I was, uh, well, like, we'd have several nicknames. They used to call me Conrad, uh, Needle Nose. My nose was much more pointed. It used to, no, it was a ski jump. They used to call me Ski Jump, Needle Nose. But we had a guy, a first saxophone player, was, his name was Godai. I don't know why, where he got the name Godai. I think it was uh, something about... Uh, uh, some new, we had some New Orleans guys in the band. Uh, Irving Fazola was from New Orleans, uh, Eddie Miller. And the New Orleans click, um, they had names for different kind. I think uh, gin was Godai or something. So he evidently drank uh, gin or Godai, so he got the name Godai. Well, anyway, Godai was so loaded that he couldn't stand up. He couldn't sit up. He couldn't sit down. And so we're up in the dressing room after the show, he, he, we'd seat, seat him in a chair, and he keeps slithering down the chair, onto the, falling onto the floor. So Billy got the idea, said, hey, look, it was wintertime. We all had overcoats. So Billy got the idea of taking Godai, and we lifted him up, and we put his overcoat on and, and wrapped his over, uh, and buttoned his overcoat down and put a coat hanger in his, um, you know, back in his collar, and we hung him in, the, in those days, the dressing rooms, had all these lights around the mirrors, and then on one wall would be all hooks to hang things. So we hung them on a, on a hook on the wall. And we continued to drink after the show while they were packing the instruments away, and we got our instruments packed away, and we ran out of booze. So somebody in the next uh, 
uh, dressing room, Eddie Miller hollered in, we've got some, uh, we've still got some old granddad in here. So we all went in um, uh, to the other room and we started drinking uh, from Eddie Miller's bottle. Well, uh, make a long story short, the bus, everything was packed and we got down on the bus and we took off. And by now it's about 2, uh, 2.30 in the morning and we got about 50 miles out of town and Billy says to me, we were sitting together, Billy says, hey, where's Godai? And we looked back and, and Godai's uh, seat was empty. And when we were all so loaded, we forgot about him. We left him back in the dressing room hanging on the, he on the hook. And uh, so we thought, my God, we got to go back and get him. So we turned around. So we got back in, in Hartford, uh, not 50 miles back, at about 4 in the morning. Uh, and of course, everything, the theater's closed up. So we went to the police station and told them what happened. So we were all up all night going back to get Godai, and when we got up in the dressing room to take him, he was hanging on the hook, having a beautiful snooze. He was just sleeping, hanging on the hook with the coat hanger. <laughs> that was the kind of stuff that used to happen all the time. Boy, I don't think I can sit here for three hours in these lights. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, that's different. That's like the story about the guy who wanted to sell another fella an elephant for, uh, for $50. And he says, no, I can't. He said, I don't want to buy an elephant. He said, the fella says, look, everybody should have a, this is a real live elephant. He said, look, I haven't got room for a sand pile in the backyard for my child, let alone an elephant. And the other fella says, how about three for 100? He says, now you're talking. <laughs> 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 <laughs>